Hello, and welcome to my weekly podcast that I call Through the Bible in 10 Years. Today, we're going to start 2 Thessalonians. So we have been in 1 Thessalonians, and we did the first, we did the five chapters of 1 Thessalonians, and I've decided to go straight into uh, 2 Thessalonians. Now, let's go ahead and, and begin. I've probably going to do introductory discussions of 2 Thessalonians after I'm done with 2 Thessalonians. This is one of the great things I learned at Asbury Seminary, Inductive Bible Study. I truly believe that I was taught a way to bracket out my assumptions about a particular text and to listen to the text and to let the text tell me what it's saying rather than to bring all of my baggage. And again, baggage is not necessarily bad, and it's impossible for me not to bring baggage to the text. By that, I mean my assumptions, my presuppositions. We can never become entirely free of our assumptions. But inductive Bible study uh, taught me to truly listen, try to listen, on, a nec- on the next level uh, to the text. And so um, it actually, I think, especially with Second Thessalonians, will be helpful to go through the text these next three weeks. And then after we've gone through these texts, to gather our um, instincts and intuitions about, about the situation. Now, you might, on the first hand, you might say, well, what, what's the big deal, Ken? Because Second Thessalonians comes after First Thessalonians, and it's written by the same people to the same audience. Assume, we should therefore assume it was written about the same time from the same place. And so the situation is surely pretty much the same as 1 Thessalonians. Well, that may very well be the case. It may. Although there are a few things about 2 Thessalonians that have, that have nagged at me over the years. I've always found 2 Thessalonians very puzzling uh, for a number of different reasons. And you, you, if, you've, if you've paid attention to me long, for very long, you know that I think that there are a lot of kind of pat answers and glib kind of assumptions that if you're in an echo chamber, it's easy to get away with because everybody's saying the same thing. But there are some things about Second Thessalonians that have nagged at me over the years. And um, I, I don't know whether I, I don't know how far I want to go with some of my thoughts. Um, I, I have a tendency to tell everything I'm thinking. <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, and I'm not, uh, you know, nobody's going to ask me to write a second Thessalonians commentary. Um, but uh, I do want to look at second Thessalonians with a fine tooth comb because, uh, I've been formulating a hypothesis now for years, frankly, for years about second Thessalonians. And I want to, I want to look at it a little bit. Um, we'll see what happens. So let's go ahead and launch into first, second Thessalonians. I should mention. I should mention that the order of the books in Paul in the Pauline letters, the order of the books, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, the order is largely by length. The books are not arranged in the order in which they were written, not at all. Romans was definitely not the first letter that Paul wrote. I think 1st Thessalonians was the first letter in the New Testament that Paul wrote. Um, and um, others would say Galatians, but nobody would say that Romans was the first letter uh, that Paul wrote. And so when we get to First and Second Thessalonians, we have to face the possibility that Second Thessalonians was written first and that First Thessalonians was written second, because their arrangement is at least in part based on the fact that First Thessalonians is longer than Second Thessalonians. First Thessalonians has five chapters. Second Thessalonians only has three. Now, most scholars, and I think rightly, have concluded that actually this, this is a fortuitous to us that Second Thessalonians is actually second and First Thessalonians is actually first. But any treatment of First and Second Thessalonians needs to at least acknowledge the possibility that the order could be reversed. And there have been those who've argued that Second Thessalonians was actually first. Well, now I'm going to really begin. So I'm looking at interlinearbible.com or biblehub.com backslash interlinear if you're looking at the video. If you're listening to the podcast, you don't have to pay any attention to what I'm looking at. And I've got a lovely uh, uh, picture in the back that is inspired by Ezekiel and appeared in the movie Knowing. 
Um, anyway, it's not, you can't fully see it. Yeah, so I'm not violating copyright, right? Anyway, um, so let's go ahead and begin with verse one. Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the, the, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse two, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Fairly standard, uh, very standard introduction. Very similar to the introduction in 1 Thessalonians. And uh, on the one hand, that, in, that initially doesn't surprise us. But uh, as we get into the rest of, of chapter one, um, the similarity is noticeable and, and somewhat striking. I'll come back to that in a second. But uh, if we take verses one and two at face value, Paul, Silas, and Timothy are the same authors as in 1 Thessalonians. Thessalonians are the same audience. And so our initial impression is certainly uh, that Paul would have written 2 Thessalonians from Corinth to Thessalonica on his second missionary journey somewhere around the years 50 and 51 AD, not too long after he wrote 1 Thessalonians. And so we can create a scenario, something like this. So Paul and Silas and Timothy founded the church at Thessalonica, but they had to leave rather quickly. When they get to Athens, uh, Paul and Silas send Timothy back to find out how their faith is doing. They go on to Corinth. While they're at Corinth, Timothy returns, and guess what? Their faith is doing great. Then Paul send, writes 1 Thessalonians and sends it back to the Thessalonian church. You'll remember that the reason for 1 Thessalonians primarily deals with end times questions. So some of them didn't realize that the resurrection was a thing. They expected the second coming, but they didn't know what would happen to the dead before that happened. Paul writes back. He says, don't worry, the dead will be part of it. Um, of course, Christ will come as a thief in the night, um, but there'll be, there'll be birth pains. But, but then we don't know the, the exact time of his return. We just need to be ready. And by the way, don't be lazy. And so Paul sends 1 Thessalonians back to them with Timothy, perhaps. Now, what may have happened then is that Timothy stays a while and some new problems emerge. Maybe, maybe they say, oh, we thought the Lord was coming back uh, right away. Has he already come back? Is our current persecution actually part of, of those birth pains? And so Timothy comes back to Paul. And Paul writes 2 Thessalonians back saying, well, okay, um, the day of the Lord hasn't happened yet. If anybody tells you that, they're cray-cray. Um, uh, there'll, be, there'll be some signs that haven't happened yet of what will happen before the Lord comes back. And so Paul writes Thessalonians uh, back to them. So that's, that's probably the standard uh, scenario for uh, thinking about the, the history of 2 Thessalonians. And for now, let's, let's go ahead and leave it at that, and we will, we will move on. Okay, verse 3. We ought to give thanks always concerning you, brothers and sisters, just as it is uh, worthy or fitting, uh, because your faith is superabounding, uh, and the love of each one of all you is abounding, is multiplying toward one another. Now, this sounds a little bit, again, like 1 Thessalonians little different wording, a few different words, but the same basic uh, Thanksgiving section. This shouldn't bother us because Thanksgiving sections did have, an, uh, I think, some commonality in Paul. Um, usually he mentions he's praying for them and things like that. So um, again, very similar to 1 Thessalonians, but not, not anything too surprising yet, perhaps. Okay, so he thinks he, he, he's excited. He thanks God always uh, because they have faith, they have love toward one another. Verse 14, I mean, verse 4, with the result that we ourselves boast in you in the assemblies of God, in the churches of God. Of course, house churches is what is probably in view here. Um, the assemblies of God church takes its name from the word church, which means assembly, among the churches of God, among the assemblies of God, the little house churches where people are gathering. And what does Paul boast about them? He boasts about, about your 
endurance, about your perseverance, and about your faith uh, among all your persecutions. Now, faith here probably has uh, more of a sense of faithfulness. The word faith has some different nuances it can have um, that you depends on the context as to which one is in view. Here, because we're talking about persecutions, probably their their faithfulness because it's even in parallel with endurance. So, um, and the faithfulness among all your tribulations um, and all the the trials uh, which you are are bearing. So, it seems that um, the situation of the Thessalonians is more intense. Uh, than it was even maybe when First Thessalonians was written. Um, they are they are demonstrating some hardcore endurance. Now, um, this leads us, of course, to wonder, you know, what what is what is changing uh, in the Thessalonian search circumstance that it's gotten worse? Of course, we have no way of knowing um, uh, what because we're not told what their tribulations exactly exactly are. We just get the impression that things have gotten worse for them. Okay, so verse five. Um, this is, we have to kind of insert it, it's not there in the Greek. This is a demonstration of the righteous judgment of God uh, with the result that you might be counted worthy of the kingdom of God on behalf of which you are suffering. So again, this, this uh, cuts into a little bit of Protestant theology uh, or some Protestant sensibilities, but there is a sense in which there their, their enduring persecution makes them worthy. Again, Martin Luther wouldn't like this, this sentiment. Uh, I, I, I haven't read his commentaries, um, so I don't know what he does with this particular passage. But um, there is a tendency among, say, Luther to say, well, you're never going to be worthy. It's all about Jesus. God only looks at Jesus. You're a dirty, rotten scoundrel before and after you come to Christ. That's not Paul's theology. Paul believes that we need to be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. This is Paul. This is Paul's theology. Um, again, this dichotomy between faith and works uh, really doesn't exist for Paul after one becomes a Christian. Um, Paul primarily talks about um, uh, faith as as the gateway into Christian faith, but Paul expects a certain way of life. A manner of living. Paul definitely, I mean, all over his writings, Paul expects there to be a manner of living after we come to Christ. That's part of Paul's theology, whether Martin Luther likes it or not. He knows better now because he's in heaven. But anyway, um, uh, this is a demonstration of the righteous judgment of God. This again reminds us a little bit of something said in 1 Thessalonians 1 in a slightly different way about how um, the, the sense we get is that that there's, there's a two-sided coin here. On the one hand, the, the fact that they are persecuting uh, the, the believers at Thessalonica is justifying the judgment of the persecutors, but it's also justifying the justification of, of the believers. Two-sided coin to suffering there. Verse, verse 6 makes this clear. For it, since indeed um, it is right for God to repay those oppressing you with oppression. <laughs> and um, to you who are being oppressed, those who are being uh, uh, persecuted, he'll give you rest along with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven or from the sky uh, with the angels of his power. Now, uh, revelation, uh, this is interesting. In First Thessalonians, the word parousia or arrival is used. But here in Second Thessalonians, we have a slightly different word, the revelation of our Lord uh, from heaven with uh, the angels of his power. Verse eight, with a flame of fire or with a fiery flame, with a flaming fire, um, giving vengeance, giving justice uh, to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus. Remember the gospel um, in the ancient world uh, primarily had to do with good news relating to a king, for example. And so the good news of, of the king, of King Jesus. Um, there, there are a couple, of, there are actually three passages uh, that this, in, with a flaming fire giving judgment to those who do not know God, there are actually several passages that, that this seems to echo. Um, it's, it's not, I'm not sure that it's quite an, uh, a quote. It's not a quote quite, 
Um, it's maybe an illusion, but definitely there, there are a couple of passages. One of them is in Isaiah 66, which talks about uh, judgment um, and I think um, hints at the new Jerusalem. That may be, that may be significant. The fact that Paul here echoes a um, a passage that has to do with uh, with Jerusalem, uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, we, I'm a, I'm going to be a little speculative next week. Next week is is a a big week um, as I specul speculate a little. I, I mean, I really don't know whether my speculations are are right or not. Um, I'll, I'll also give you the simple uh, version, um, but um, I wonder if there are echoes. Well. I do think there are echoes of Jerusalem uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2. So we'll come back, come back to that next week. But so somebody's going to get it. Um, those who are persecuting the Thessalonians are going to get it. Um, verse 9. Uh, again, I wonder if, there, if, this, if, if, if there's something bigger going on here, um, a bigger persecution perhaps in, in mind. Verse 9. Um, so these people who are persecuting you and us, um, you, I suppose, if we take it in the most limited sense of the Thessalonians, um, God, uh, these these people, these people who will suffer justice, they'll suffer the penalty of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His strength. Now, some have some have suggested that that there are Jews in Thessalonica who are persecuting the Thessalonians. I don't, I don't see it. I mean, I'll keep that in mind as we keep going through. I'm thinking that that um, secular, non-Jewish persecution is in view here. Um, so we'll we'll track that as we keep going through it. A lot of puzzles with Second Thessalonians. It's a puzzling text. The more you dig into it, in my mind, I've come up with some speculations, but um, uh, it is a puzzling text to me in some respects. Verse ten: Whenever he uh, that is Jesus will come to be glorified uh, among his holy ones, among his saints. Christians are referred to as holy ones, set apart ones um, uh, in Paul's writings. And to be marveled at uh, by all who believe, all who have faith, the word believe and faith, have faith are the same, same concept there. Because uh, you all, uh, because our witness, our testimony was believed by you on that day. Um, so on that day when he returns, uh, we will marvel, we who believe will marvel at him. And, and the reason why we get to be part of the, of the part that are happy when he comes is because we have believed, um, we have believed the witness of the scriptures and of the saints since, but the Thessalonians believed the witness of Paul and Silas and Timothy, um, verse eleven. Uh, because of which, also we are always praying concerning you. Again, it reminds us of First Thessalonians one, in order that God, our God, might deem you worthy of 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 a calling, of an election. Again, notice the wording here. This is not worded the way John Calvin would have it worded, uh, because. Um, if, if you're elected in the way that John Calvin says, then, then your calling is what makes you worthy, as it were. You're not worthy of the calling. It's the calling that makes you worthy. Um, this is worded in such a way that seems to indicate that our behavior, our actions, play a role in whether we get the calling or, or, or whether the calling makes it to the end. And so, as I've said often, talking about predestination in Scripture, uh, in the words of Inigo Mantoya, uh, addressed to the Calvin, to John Calvin, you keep on using that word predestination. I don't think it means what you think it means. Um, because here, calling is something that you need to be worthy of. Um, and that he might fill, uh, fulfill every good pleasure of goodness and every work of faith with power. Okay, again, notice that work of faith. These are not contrary terms for Paul, and also in a, a, an allusion or an, an echo of 1 Thessalonians here uh, as well. So what's the point of all this? Verse 12, 
so that the name of our Lord Jesus might be glorified among you, and you might be glorified, I guess, in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, again, uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 is fairly short, just like 1 Thessalonians 1 was fairly short. Of course, the chapter divisions were, were added a thousand, you know, over a thousand years later. But this has been 1 Thessalonians 1. Now, I'm finding it intriguing because of other concerns. By itself, this chapter is not too uh, unusual. I would say it has very close parallels to 1 Thessalonians 1 and its greetings. Same themes, a lot of the same concepts, but also some interestingly different words, some, some words that aren't used in very often in Paul's writings. We get the impression that their persecution has intensified. I would say it has more intensity. There is an intensity here, a heaviness that 1 Thessalonians 1 didn't have. It feels like, like things are a little rougher, maybe, uh, than they were uh, in 1 Thessalonians. And so we'll continue to ponder that heaviness uh, as we move again into uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 next week. So this has been Through the Bible in 10 years, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1.